Hello and welcome back to another episode of the O's Talk. My name is Zetrot, and today we're going to be going over the recap of group stage to the Tyco World Cup. I'm actually joined with some of the commentators that were with me during group stage and one of the players from Team Germany. I'm going to introduce them now. Um, starting from the commentators that helped me during group stage, we have Tasha with us. How you doing, man? Uh, not too bad. Yourself? I'm doing excellent. Thank you for asking. And we also have Deadbeat, which is uh, my co-host to the talk normally and also helped us commentating with Tyco World Cup this year. How you doing, Deadbeat? Slowly getting more and more stressed. <laughs> we also have Timus here, who has been taking part in the Tyco World Cup as well and is an active member of Team Germany. How you doing, man? Hello, I'm doing fine. All right. So we're going to go over each little individual thing that happened with group stage. And the first thing is we're going to go ahead and get out the overall results here. And I'm going to go through each group and just list off their statistics and we'll continue from there. So starting off with group A, we have Taiwan, which won all five of the matches that they played. Um, they lost zero of them. They won 20 beat maps and they only lost one map there so that was excellent on their side we also have south korea who played five of their matches and um they won four of them only lost one winning 17 maps and only losing six um up next we have finland who played all five of their games they won three of them lost two of them and had an overall maximum maps of one of 12 and games lost of nine um and then with the Philippines, we also have five games played, two of them won, three of them lost, um, eight games won overall, and 12 games lost overall. And then we also have Singapore, who played their five games, only winning one of them, losing four, winning only four matches, and losing a grand total of 18 matches there. And with Australia, unfortunately for those guys down under, they played their five matches, um, didn't win any of the five matches, they did win five beat maps during the tournament, and they lost all 20. Uh, they lost 20 matches there, and that is for Group A. If I can just quickly point something out here, because I did find this quite funny. Um, as you mentioned, South Korea lost six points, right? Mm-hmm. So four well, of those Taiwan. would have been. To, yeah, four of them would have been yeah. for Taiwan. The other two mm -hmm. were Australia. Ouch. All right, let's see here, and um. Uh, Going through these, um, now, we're pulling this information from the actual results page here, and I'm going to assume that the teams in red are teams that did not make it through to round of 16, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, the two teams that are currently listed in red, um, so Singapore mm -hmm. and Australia, unfortunately will not be advancing to the uh, double elimination bracket stage. Mm -hmm. So, for our Group A members, we have Taiwan, South Korea, Finland, and Philippines. And those are all going to be moving forward in Group A. Now let's go ahead and move down to Group B here. Um, in Group B, we have China, which played all five of their matches, won all five of their matches, lost none of their matches, won 20 beat maps, and only lost seven of them. Um, following after them, we have Germany, who played all five of their matches, won four of their matches, only lost one of their matches, um, took 17 beat map victories, and only lost seven. Um, Poland comes in at five, with all five matches played, three of them winning, um, two of them losing, and winning 16 maps and only conceding defeat to nine of their maps picked. And then Ukraine comes in at five matches. They played um, all five of them. Two of them they won, three of them they lost. They took 12 wins total and lost 15. And then we have Denmark who played all five of their matches, only winning one of them, losing four of them, and uh, only taking five beat map victories and losing out to 16 of them. And then we have Norway, which unfortunately seems to have lost all of their matches. All five games were played, if I'm not mistaken. Some of these might be no-shows. Uh, we'll try to see if we can get um, uh, verification on that a little bit later. Um, they also came in with um, uh, only taking four beat map victories and losing 20 of those. And the um, uh, people that will not exceed in Group B or move on is going to be Denmark and Norway. All the people advancing in Group B are going to be China, Germany, Poland, and Ukraine. Definitely can't say I'm too surprised about China and Germany advancing. They're oh, no. performing really well throughout the entire tournament so far. 
Yes, most definitely. Germany and China have been really strong. Um, Ukraine did okay, but um, very close there um, on them actually not making it. So they need to pull it up if they're going to do any better here. And now we're going to move on to Group C. And um, Group C, ooh, this has got some of the really good ones here, in my opinion. Uh, we have Japan, uh, obviously, playing all five matches, winning all five matches, and only conceding two beat maps lost. So that means they've won 20 of their games. Very just, impressive. Just to fill in, the only two games they lost, or the only two uh, beat maps they lost, were to France and Canada. Oh, man. You guys got you guys got a victory on them. How good yeah, do you feel? Um. I feel pretty lucky considering they ended up having one person on Team Japan miss, and that's the only reason that we won that match, but I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll take the win. Yeah, most definitely, man. You got to take what you can get. All right, and then um, continuing on in Group C, we have France with all five matches played, winning four of them and um, uh, losing only one. And uh, on their beat maps one, they have uh, took home 17 uh, games, and on the beat maps lost, they only lost five. Argentina, all five games being played, they've won three of their matches, two of them lost, and um, overall maps won 13, and they conceded defeat to nine of those. Uh, and now for Canada, they played all five matches, winning two of them, conceding three losses, winning 10 beat maps, and only losing 12. So that was pretty even on your guys' side, almost, you know, you guys kind of just barely missed that getting a uh, victory on one of those if i'm not mistaken um no it was uh I, i'd say it was pretty close we i think we could have performed a little bit better and maybe beaten argentina but it you know it just it ends up being the way it ended up happening we we at least advanced right so i'm happy with that yeah and for uh the other two teams here that won't be moving on we have italy they am uh one they played five they only won one match uh, they lost four of them. They won on four beat maps and lost 16. And I'd like to point out that the only match they won was the only one that mattered because that was the one we we totally bet on and I got free pizza. So just so. for anyone that is wasn't there for Taika World Cup during the stream, um, there was a little bit of a, a friendly bet between myself, Zetra, Deadbeat, and Ephemeral where we ended up uh, betting lunch over which team would win so zetra ended up getting a pizza because we bet on sweden they bet on italy and well that's just the way the cookie crumbles i guess yes and um speaking of sweden sweden uh not winning any of their matches and not taking any games unfortunately so they have all 20 games lost there and uh italy and sweden will not be advancing um, to the round of 16. They should go and to a bucket why... because, um, sorry, just quickly. I was going to say, no the, uh, I reckon France probably could have gotten a few more points off Japan, actually. That was a really close game. Oh, I definitely yeah, agree. Was. Like, if you that guys was... actually haven't seen it, I recommend you check the VOD when you can. It was a really good match. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was definitely a highlight of the tournament, that's for sure. Even though the match ended up with uh, only France winning one match, they played really good. Yeah. They did. They gave they gave them a run for the money. They were on it. All the matches during that were really close, scored wise. Um, and last but not least, getting Group D uh, done here, the United States, playing all five of their matches, winning all five of them, which has got me really surprised here. I actually think I only was able to sit in for maybe two of the United States games, uh, winning uh, 20 of their beat maps and only losing and conceding to three of them. So, actually, a lot stronger than I thought the United States was going to be. That's really impressive, actually. Yeah. Especially um, since they had uh, Hong Kong in their group. Yeah, and Hong Kong here, um, they played all five of their um, uh, games as well, winning four of them, only losing one, uh, taking 18 wins, and only conceding three losses in the maps. Um, Indonesia winning three of their matches, three of the five possible matches, uh, taking loss only to two of them, winning overall 13 beat maps and conceding defeat to 12 of them. The quick correction, uh, Hong Kong lost six matches, not three. Hong Kong that lost was, six? Yeah, it was the United States that lost three. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for getting that fixed up. We apologize no for that. All right, and then um, uh, Spain, uh, out of their five matches, they won two of them, uh, lost three, taking 12 beat map victories and losing 12 beat map victories. So they went straight down the middle there. Um... 
And for the two teams in Group D that will not be advancing, Chile, um, out of the five games, they won one. Um, they lost four. They took six beat map victories and lost 16 of them. And Hungary, which played all their games, losing all of their games, taking no victories, and having 20 defeats. I believe and, um, Hungary actually didn't play any of their matches. I think that most of them yeah. were win by defaults. Yeah, it actually yeah, does look didn't. here. Yep. All the all theirs are win by defaults, it looks like, as I'm checking those. Yeah, Hungary did not show up, um, unfortunately. And, you know, these things happen. Uh, it might have been due to stress, pressure, uh, timing might have been something, you know. Something might have came up from one of their team members and they just weren't able to participate. These things happen. And while I know people were probably rooting for their country, it, it's no need to get mad at the players because um, these things happen, you know. But, Especially when the players are, you know, they're playing the competition to have fun and mm -hmm. be up, like they're in, they're just trying to like kind of show everyone the mode a little bit, mm -hmm. have a bit of fun and just, you know, show some people how good, you know, some Taiko players really are. Mm -hmm. And that actually uh, concludes the wrap up for the group stage stuff. Now we're going to get on to kind of a little bit with the map um, statistics here. Um, a lot of people like to know how that goes and I'm going to go ahead and let Tasha go over the map statistics here if that's uh, what you want to do yeah i'd like to do that but just one little thing first i just wanted to mention something about group d because you guys were mentioning that you were surprised about how the united states were formed the united states mm -hmm. is probably one of the strongest north american teams right now and they actually have a pretty real chance of getting like top four with how strong they are um some of their players like flanks for example are beatingly good Probably better than some of the players in the uh, Japanese teams. Well, I wouldn't say maybe Japanese, but like South Korean teams, things like that. They're they're definitely a force to be reckoned with. Uh, the only uh, name I actually recognize is uh, Ozzy Otterock, and he's been in these before. He's he's no stranger to the Tiger World Cups. Oh, definitely not. He's been around since, I think, the beginning. Yeah, he has. I was yeah. actually going back and looking at the uh, previous uh, results. So yeah, I imagine he'll I'm... be able to uh, help out his team quite a bit. Especially with all that experience. Yeah, and I've noticed Ozzy Azarak before. I'm I've seen maps, if I'm not mistaken, or at least high scores on maps. The name definitely sticks. Um, but yeah, he's I done. Just... Sorry, he, I was just going to mention he has done both maps and he has been um, top player a few different times. Yeah, and it's not that I don't really um think that the United States can do it as much. It's just I'm so used to seeing us, you know, usually. We, we, can, we can get to finals, well not finals, but we usually get to semifinals in most of the tournaments or quarterfinals and then we usually buy, you know. But it's just really interesting to see how strong they started out in group stage here and it definitely leaves me hoping to uh, see them in the semifinals or even maybe the finals. I think that'd be cool. And I think they're also kind of lucky this year too because the last couple of years they've been placed against Japan as their first match in brackets so they haven't really gotten very far, especially considering those previous tournaments were single elimination. Yeah. Anyway, um, so we are going to talk about the uh, map pool. So let me just get ready to go look at that now. So the Nomad picks were kind of interesting for map pool. There was a lot of um, unique maps that were picked that all had their own little, you know, things that made them interesting to watch. One of the ones mm -hmm. that um, ended up getting picked about 13 times, and it was the first Nomad pick, was da 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 which uh, became a bit of a Twitch sensation while that was being uh, <laughs> streamed. We won't get too much into detail with that, but that map there was uh, really interesting because towards the end of it, there is a section that is all finisher notes, and I think there's about 16 finisher notes in a row. So it ends up being really difficult for a lot of the players to hit those and get the double bonus score from each note. Um, what are your thoughts on that map anyway, Tinoos? Um, I think that map... Um... Is pretty much um, a kind of weird, but also a bit of cool because, as you mentioned, um, the finishers at the end with every die uh, uh, she was singing was a, a, ch a chance to get double points, and that is uh, it can be a, a good chance to to get uh, ahead of the team. Yeah, especially if there's some teams that can't actually hit all the finishers. So I think that a lot of teams pick that just hoping the other team couldn't hit them. Or maybe, you know, anticipating they couldn't hit them or feeling they could hit them better. Um, 
The second Nomad pick was Seven Colors. It was picked 10 times during the tournament. Um, this map had some... It was a, it was a pretty um, average Nomad pick. It had some parts in it that had some a little bit awkward timing, especially towards the end, because um, there's some offbeat 1-4 um, stuff. I'm curious about what your input is on this map as well. Um, this map wasn't, as you said, nothing. It's just a normal map, I think, I suppose, and it it was okay to play it, but it wasn't, as you said, just a normal map, I think. All right. Okay, so the next map, and this is actually the least played map in the tournament was, so far, uh, was Daybreaker. Uh, this is a map by Onosaki Hito. It was picked four times. Um, for this map here, I, I can kind of understand why it wasn't picked too much. It had a very low uh, slider velocity, which means the notes don't scroll very fast. So there's a lot of notes on the playing field at any given moment. And it makes it kind of hard to play accurately. So there being a lot of doubles in the map and there also being slow scroll speed, I don't think many people were comfortable with that map pick like in a tournament setting. But I feel that's why a lot of people didn't end up picking it. The, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. One of thought is um, one of the uh, reason is also um, that is it's one of the most maps that has the DDD uh, uh, three um, damn it. <laughs> the offhand stuff, yeah. So when you have like DDD KKK DDD, where it's all in triples, but it's in a one four stream. Um, for anyone that's not familiar, that for people that play with the authentic playstyle, which is a KDDK playstyle, if you have the ZXCV keys, um, it ends up making you do hand switching if you're playing with an alternating playstyle, which can be very confusing to people that play that way, and it's one of the harder patterns to actually play properly. Um, so the fourth map that was um, included in the Nomad pool was Seventh Heaven. Uh, Seventh Heaven was picked 11 times during the tournament and was probably one of the Nomad picks that was a little bit hard to get an SS on for even the really good teams because it has a higher base overall difficulty than any of the other maps that were introduced in Nomad. Um, it also had some pretty streamy stuff going on in it, so it was probably one of the more difficult Nomad picks that was included in the map pool. Yeah, um, the thing about that map is as you said, it's just with his high OD of 6.5, I think, it's pretty um, not used to play it. Because most of the maps were like 5 to 6, but not over 6, most of them. Yeah, it's not very common for um, many Oni maps that are around this difficulty level to be above 5 or 6 overall difficulty. So there being a map that was 6.5 probably threw a few accuracy players uh, for a loop and ma made that map not as uh, popular of a pick as it could have been. Um, so the next map that was in Nomad Pool was Black and White. Now this was a really popular pick. It was picked 27 times, and that's actually tied for first on the most picked maps. Um, mm -hmm. This was one of the... I, I'd say it's probably one of the easiest included Nomad picks that was um, in this map pool. So I, I'm actually not too surprised that it ended up being a very popular pick, just because for a lot of the teams that say may not have been as good it's a place where they can actually perform just as well against teams that are good because there's not as much of a um a gap in say accuracy or pattern playing skills and easier maps uh what do you think about that tms well i think um because of the way that this can be played so easily it is also it is as you said a chance for not weakened but not so um professional players um to get um, some scores for the matches, and it's like their only chance to uh, um, proceed during the matches. And another thing I would say is because the the fact that it's just an, an enemy opening. So it's like, oh, I know this song. I like to play it. So that, I think it's kind of like that. Yeah, definitely, like I was saying, it's just um, it's a map that's a bit easier for players to pick up, so they'll definitely go for that one if they're not as strong of a team. Um, what do you guys think, anyway, Deadbeat and Z-Trot? Because uh, I know you guys aren't very familiar with Tycho, but it was a very commonly picked map, so I'm kind of curious about what you guys thought about it. Well, um, I feel that that was probably one of the maps we saw the most from behind victories on. 
Um, that was actually, and it's funny that you say it's easier for teams to play against the higher, te higher teams, but what we kind of saw, especially during the first day of group stage, what we saw happening is that the higher seeded teams and the more better players here were actually making mistakes on the easier maps and, you know, giving victories out to the lower seeded teams there. And I don't know if that was just because they didn't practice on the easier map as much or it just tripped them up because they were, you know, in the moment decided to play fast, but... Um, it was one of the ones we saw a lot of from behind victories come from. And you have to remember is um, even as very skilled teams, you have a lot of nerves playing those maps. So a lot of those misses might have actually been just from nerves alone, especially if it's mm -hmm. a team that has good players, but they haven't participated in a Taika World Cup before because the tournament playing environment is a lot different than just playing by yourself. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, on to the next map. The next map is Prismatic Lollipops. Um, this map was another Nomad pick and was picked... I'm trying to find out how many times, Seer, sorry. 16. 16 times. And this is probably one of the, again, it's kind of like an average map, kind of like seven colors, but a bit harder in difficulty in comparison. Um, it had a lot of triplets in it and also quintuplets. So there was, you know, it was just basic pattern training for some of the more... Um, consistent teams but it might have caused some of the beginning teams to struggle a bit more um i don't really know because i didn't really uh end up watching many of the matches that played prismatic lollipops but i feel that many of the beginning teams probably struggled with this map um i'm gonna actually ask zetra because i believe he was around for some of the plays for this map so i'm curious yeah prismatic uh lollipops um we saw some of the lower seeded teams start having difficulty of that either early on or, you know, in the beginning. But um, once they got their momentum going, it would kind of be good. You'd kind of see a uh, accidental drop every once in a while because the patterns, like you said, they kind of got a little confusing. And that's where you'd see the most drops. Um, for the more consistent higher seeded teams, they knocked it straight out of the park. And uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on the map anyway as well, TMS? I'm curious. Well, I think the map was, I think, actually pretty easy because um, I think it was one of those maps that was uh, with a high chance to get it like an SS, uh, I mean, 100% to get it. I mean, it just had easy to play with that map. So I don't know um, if it just appealing or it just actually um, just easy for myself. Well, don't forget, there was actually one part at the very end of that map that is um, a pretty um, confusing stream to play for, especially for newer players, where it had uh, some offhand stuff going on. Uh, yeah, I remember. Now, uh, we're going to go into the hidden picks now. So, the first hidden pick was Nekomata Masters Squall. Um, Squall was one of the least picked hidden maps and one of the uh, lowest picked maps in the tournament. It was uh, picked five times. Um, for this map, I actually really liked this map, but unfortunately, because it was one of the hardest maps in this map pool, in my opinion, um, I feel a lot of teams were afraid of playing it, um, even the even the more uh, experienced teams, I would say, because um, just because there's so much more room for error compared to every other map that was in the map pool. Um, mm. It had a lot of one-sixth quads in it, so there was some patterns that, you know, even experienced teams could end up missing on and there's a section in the big in the middle of the map that has some really um heavy beat oriented stuff where it's a lot of off beat um it's really hard to get good accuracy on and like i said unfortunately we didn't end up seeing it too much but uh, i hope that we end up seeing some maps like this in further um parts of the tournament so like in round of 16 where we have already actually seen the map pool and there's some good hidden picks there um and I'm hoping we see even better ones when we get into like the quarterfinals. Uh, what are your thoughts on this map anyway, Tiamis? Um, The map uh, this was uh, pretty good and uh, I think um, it's got, its, as you said, its weird moments like the one third nose and the, a bit of the slowdowns. Um, but it was an authentic map to play. Um, we actually enjoyed playing that map, but because of the fact that it's hard to play and it's hidden, a mod which not every player ca uh, is able to play it, it's just um, one of those maps that sadly got the least um, picks. 
Yeah, and I just wanted to uh, cover really quickly that this map probably would have been one of the hardest maps that was picked in the map pool, even if it did not have hidden. So that's just a cool note to consider about that map. Um, the next map that we have in the hidden pool was Mind Mapping. And this was a very popular pick throughout the tournament, and it was actually the most popular hidden pick with 19 picks throughout the um, entire group stage. Um, this is a pretty basic map, even with hidden. It had some... Um, it had some 1-4 streams in it. It had some pretty basic Tycho patterns, nothing too complicated in it. I think the um, reason this ended up being one of the more consistent picks throughout the tournament is because it was an easier hidden pick, and because it had just um, one section that was hard enough that it would possibly make newer players miss. So if the newer players ended up practicing that map against other newer teams, they might have had an advantage. Um, the thing about this map as well is that a lot of the good teams would end up picking this map just because it was such an easy map to get very good accuracy on. So you had a lot of the good teams ending, get, ending up getting 1-100 or even double Sing the map just because it's a low accuracy requirement map and because it wasn't too hard for them to read the map. The fact that if, um, if BPM was a bit over 180, uh... It makes it e really easy to read it uh, uh, because, if, as you said, um, if you get, had a, a hidden pick, you just see the the first notes at the b very b very beginning, and if a map got a low BPM, just for example, score with just 165, it's harder to uh, to recognize or get the rhythm for the notes to play. So, and with mind mapping that was like 190 or something, um. It was pretty mediocre for everyone to play because everyone had the same or uh, good time to react to for the notes. Yeah, just as as a note, we do have um, oftentimes a little bit harder time getting the first note when we're playing hidden in Tycho if there is a slower BPM. So I think that's what TMS was trying to cover there. Um. Okay, so the final hidden pick was actually one of the longer ones, but again, wasn't picked very often. It was Catastrophe, picked nine times. Um, this map, it, it's not a very difficult map, I, I gotta be honest, it's really not. A lot of the difficulty of this map just came from how long it was, so it challenged players to stay consistent and, you know, not miss a note. Um, missing a note, especially in group stage against a competent team, is going to really cause issues because of the amount of points you will lose just from a single miss. It's not as bad as in, you know, oh, standard, but it's definitely enough that a miss can cause your team to lose. Um, I'm not really sure if I liked this hidden pick as much as the other two. I felt that they were a lot better picks for group stage. Um, I'm not really sure how you would feel about that, though. Hmm. I thought the map had, because uh, that I got many finishers uh, in the song, I think like over 40 or 50 uh, finishers, uh, that's a pretty high amount of finishers for a map. So, um, the, as you said, it was not hard to play, but I think it was hard to proceed with a high score during the finishers and during the accuracy. And just overall consistency. Yeah, that's exactly what I was covering there. Um, so, okay, we're finished with the hidden picks now. The next picks we're going to go into were the hard rock picks. Um, I apologize in advance if I say this wrong, but one of the, uh, the first hard rock pick was Yume Miru Mama Ni Koi Woshite. And <laughs> I tried my best. Um, this map was uh, picked, let's see here, I gotta find it, 10 times. Mm hmm throughout the tournament and was probably one of the more fun just, just flat out fun maps that was introduced in the tournament i, I really like this map because it had some uh, pretty cool offhand stuff so it's like kdd kddk um so a lot of that stuff that kind of makes people switch up their hands i know that doesn't really matter for people that play with my play style like i play ddkk which is not considered authentic but i thought it, i thought it was a lot of fun and there's a lot of energy in the song, so it kind of uh, helps you calm down your nerves a little bit. Or at least it did for me. Um, also, being a hard rock map, it was probably one of the easier hard rock maps to end up getting a 
double S on or getting very close to double S just because it had a very consistent rhythm throughout the song. And it has, other than those specific patterns I mentioned, a pretty easy um, to follow map. I'm not sure uh, if TMS would agree here just because I know that the play styles are a bit different, but I'm, I guess I would like to know. <laughs> um, I, I personally thought because the fact that this map was easy to play and uh, good to read, it also it got the increased chance for lower teams to get a high score and a better chance of um, passing them. So I think there was the same problem with um, that one easy map, uh, black and white. Um, mm -hmm. I was, agree there. Yeah. So it, it although it was like uh, just picked ten times. Um, it still shows um, how consistent um, um, a player needs to play this map because I gotta be honest, we don't like uh, that. We we didn't like in the, our team the map, so we so we had to, I fought to ban we fought to ban it because it we thought it was just too easy to uh, SS or um, make it with a high combo. And I guess that would really be a good choice, especially if you're like playing against a team that you feel is better than you, because then there's the added pressure that you could possibly mess up, especially if you're like, you know, Germany is a really strong team. Um, so if they are playing against somebody that was even stronger than them, like I'm not entirely sure what your group stage was. I should go look really quick here. Well, we just lost against China with one to four, and um, it, yeah, after... so against a team like China, you definitely would want to have maps that you're really comfortable playing on. Yeah, and in the fact, um, the only uh, win winning match, winning a round against China was just with a double time map. So, I think that was it's one of the evidence that shows um, that a any map can, um, wh whatever how hard or how easy it is, can um, make your team lose or win. Exactly. Um, so our next map is Burn, which was a map that was done by Nashman, a good friend of mine. Um, and unfortunately, it wasn't picked too much. It was only picked nine times. Um, I liked this map, but we didn't end up picking it very much just because it does have a very high accuracy requirement. Um, it also has some really, really difficult finishers for a lot of players where they're mixed in with a lot of triplets. So it makes it a lot harder for people to get the double point bonus from those finishers and also keeping their accuracy. Because um, as, as I mentioned, it's a hard rock pick and it's already pretty high accuracy requirement as it is. So a lot of people might have struggled just keeping a decent accuracy. Um, it also has some slower parts in it. So um, believe it or not, slower parts in hard rock are actually a little bit harder to play than streamy parts, at least when you get to a certain level. And that's mostly because it's harder to keep a rhythm when there's less notes. So I think that might have been why it wasn't picked as much. Um, and a lot of the beginner teams probably didn't end up picking it just because of the finisher finishers that were in the Kiai moments. Edgy, I think one of the reasons it got banned quite a bit as well on top of that is because I noticed it got banned quite a fair amount of time as well. Yeah, that was uh, actually what I was mentioning there. Like It was both banned and not picked very much just because of those two things I mentioned the finishers, and the difficulty in keeping accuracy. I was actually kind of sad to uh, see it banned like that, because I actually used that map to uh, practice every now and then, so it was a shame. And uh, what are your thoughts on it, Demus? Um We played that ma map actually a lot of in the group stage, I think, three times of that, and mainly because our Captain Luna loved, uh, likes that map really much, um, because of the fact that it's not just um, a, a, an HR map, but it's also the, I guess, in the SV fastest map. So um, there was um, the, the fun for our captain. And many of us, of us uh, liked that map, not decent, but were okay to play it. Um, from the map itself, I have to uh, see the finishers and the triplets uh, are definitely a uh, a problem for am amateurs or mediocre players because, as you said, um, finishers can get hard. Uh, yeah. And, the, and um, the slow parts, I have to agree. Um, if the song gets slower, 
you need to get the rhythm right. Also, um, you have the the reaction. It doesn't change automatically um, with this. So I think it was a good pick for this stage. And fortunately, we just didn't see it too much. Um, at least in comparison to the next map, which was picked uh, two more times, which was uh, center, piece, uh, center Piercing, which was picked 11 times throughout the tournament. Um, this was a, a pretty interesting map because it's overall pretty slow and easy to accuracy on. But there is one section towards the end of the map where there is a very difficult 1-4 stream, especially considering the scrolling speed. That probably ended up making a lot of people um, just have difficulty hitting it, especially the newer teams. I, I mean, even as one of the more experienced players in this tournament, I still get a little bit nervous when I see streams like that at that speed. Because one slight misread can end up with you missing on that. And that really... Against the stronger teams, you really don't want to miss on something like that. Because if they don't miss, you're just gonna, you're never going to catch up because the rest of the song is simple. Um... So I'm not sure if you agree with me there, or if even Deadbeat or Z try to agree with me there, but it was definitely one of the more interesting Hard Rock picks just because of that 1-4 stream. Well, I do know for the 1-4 uh, stream with the Hard Rock and everything like that, um, one of our commentators kind of felt that the map was a little bit um, lackluster, but I thought it was fine, personally. I felt that it was map decent enough. And so, just in case, if you're listening and you've, and you've been paying attention to the entire group stage and you saw that, um, don't mind his comments too much. He he just he's silly. Eph Ephemeral so. likes to do that kind of stuff. He's he's yeah. nice like that. But it's okay. We all love him anyway. Um, okay, so going into the double time picks, uh, I'm just gonna take over here because oh. we we run a bit short on time. Okay. Go so ahead. with yeah. the uh, with double time picks, we had uh, Yozakura Niki Mino Kakushite, Touch You Right, uh, yeah, Touch You Right Now, and True My Heart. Uh, we actually mm -hmm. saw most of these picks quite a bit, except for True My Heart. We didn't see that one that often, only getting picked five times, I believe. Yeah, you know, and I think the reason why True My Heart got picked only five times total is just, it was so short. Like, it was already, um, if I'm not mistaken, it was the TV size of the song to begin with, correct? That is true, yeah. I think. Yes. Yeah, so it, it, it just blew through, and I can understand why people wouldn't want to pick that uh, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but my whole reasoning before that would be that it's over so fast, and the ability to make a mistake is detrimental. Like, one mistake, and it's done, and, and it's over so quick, it's easy to do that, and you don't have any time to recover. So that one mistake is pretty much lost to the match there. So I could see how it would easily be banned out or just avoided for that reason alone. That actually ended up happening a few times during the tournament, where there was people that ended up missing on that very short map. Yeah, and that just kind of concedes you there. And then the other double time picks uh, were, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you said Yozakura Nikimi o Kai, uh, Kakushite. Yeah, that one actually got played ten times. But the one that surprised me that got played the most, real quick going over that, uh, was Touchy Right Now. I'm surprised that that got the most plays on it for I, the double time pick. I actually, we actually saw that quite a bit late on set uh, on Sunday. I don't think we'd seen it much before that. It seemed like no, a very it, late pick. Mm -hmm. Towards the, uh, like in the beginning of the tournament, there wasn't very many times it was being played, but as the tournament progressed, it was being picked more and more. Yeah, it was definitely yeah. a, a late bloomer there. <laughs> but it, it did take off pretty well. But uh, overall, I do believe that's everything that came down in the last uh, thing was we only saw in group stage two tiebreakers. There was also the free mod picks as well. Yeah, the free mods. We yeah, had mod. uh, Hashiro Sekai to Bokura no Mirai, uh, R176, which was insanely popular, and Odds and Ends, which was also quite popular as well. In fact, oh, both yeah, of them got were... picked up more than 20 times apiece. Yeah, Odds yeah. and Ends and uh, Hashiro Sekai to Bokura, or sorry, R176. Uh, R R176 and Odds and Ends were some of the top three most popular picked maps. Mm -hmm. on the only other map that was even close to that was black and white, which was 27 picks as well. Those are the top three. Now I'm not surprised that, that the uh, so I'm, just, I'm not surprised that the free mod picks tended to be the uh, more popular ones. Yeah, and I was about to say that. Do you feel that the reason why they were the more popular ones was just because uh, it gave you the ability to choose what mods you wanted to go for? 
I would definitely say that. Yeah, there's a lot more freedom. So like if you have, let's say you have a team that has like two good players and one average player, it's really good because the average player could just play without mods and, you know, still do re relatively well on the map. And then the better players can up it up a little bit a notch and, you know, push for like, say, two mods that they are comfortable getting like SSs or whatever on. Yeah, but the thing that we did end up seeing a lot of is uh, people were kind of forcing mod hands on it. I mean, some people would stick to like what you said, and they'd only um, uh, they'd leave the players that couldn't hang with the higher ability. They're like, here, go ahead and just play it standard. We'll take care of the mods. Some teams did that, but I saw a lot of the higher teams, they would mimic whatever the other team was doing. It, it might not be hard rock exactly, but... They would they would come with it with hidden or something you know to just uh, rebuttal that, and we saw a lot of that actually, especially against some of the better teams because as against the better teams there there's a very good chance they're not gonna miss with those mods so if you don't play with it the same amount of mods as they do then you're gonna have trouble. Yeah. All right, and that would and with that that actually wraps up the entire map pool for group stage if I'm not mistaken, correct? That is correct. All right, and um uh. We're sorry we did have to rush that a little bit, but we want to try to make this uh, as short but as informative as possible for the group stage. That way you guys are all excited and ready for the round of 16. And the last thing we're going to go over real quick before we wrap this up today is a little bit of the round of 16 map pool. Now, I myself have not checked it yet, but I'm almost positive that uh, Tasha and Timus have. So I'd like them to go ahead and close out this episode with um, uh, just a few thoughts on the round of 16 map pool and what they feel that might be seen being played actively during this okay. next stage. Well, I'm not going to say what I feel is going to be played actively, but I can say what I do feel is not going to be played actively. Battle of Rose. This is uh, probably one of the hardest maps that's been introduced in the, the new map pool. Not because of the difficulty of the map itself, but because of the mod it is under. It is a hidden pick, and it is very slow scrolling speed which requires a lot of um, remembering what notes have uh, gone past the hidden mark. So I don't think it's actually going to get picked very much, and I think TMS actually agrees with me here. Totally. It just, the BPM is just so low that you just have to memorize like every single note. Yes, when I was actually watching uh, Orno play this during the showcase, I have to agree with Tasha and Timus here. It does look rather tricky because of the slow scroll speed. Yeah, and I think it's because of the slow scroll speed where a lot of this difficulty is coming into. I think another map word which would I think definitely not be picked is like U Utara bi Gararazu, if I get it right, because if it it's with hard rock and two hundred BPM it's extremely fast for for this uh pick. I mean you have just like Point zero, uh, point two five seconds to react, and most of the players can't uh, do that. Um, ah, so just, sorry, I was just going to mention one last map that is probably not going to um, be seen very often is just because of the sheer difficulty of it is Thieves Night Trick. Now, the reason this one probably won't be seen very much is because there's some pretty difficult finisher stuff in it. Um, like even things, some things that are uh, questionably rankable. Uh, at least um, nowadays, where you have some like one third dawn with a finisher dawn following it, um, not very commonly seen in mapping, and it's actually quite difficult to play. Um, not only that, it's also hidden, so it's very difficult to read. And because it's a a swing time map, and it has a lot of doubles in it, that's very difficult to read and hidden because you're constantly having to read that spacing between notes. Yeah, one of the other ones I'm a bit unsure about was the uh, double five judge light which was actually a late addition to the double time pick, uh, the double time mod pool, and it does look quite difficult. I can see a lot of teams having issues with this map. I, 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 I can see that, but I think some of the stronger teams are going to go for that map, just because it is a uh, harder map. Because think it will give them like the uh, easy points? Uh, yeah, that's what I think. I think a lot of the teams that are stronger are going to go for that map because it is difficult, and it'll most likely cause some of the uh, less experienced teams to miss. In-depth strategy. Yeah, kind of. Um, and with this 210 BPM in, on double time, and with the end, which like, and a chaos with so much different patterns, it's just um, like the advantage for pro teams. Um, just just to get out of the uh, you know not 
going to be picked maps. Let's look at like, some of the maps that we think are going to be picked. One of the maps I definitely think is going to be seen a lot is Punk Anthem Track, which is a Hard Rock pick. And the reason for that is this is a map that has been in Taika World Cup before and is often, the, at least in the previous Taika World Cups, was picked a lot. I think it's just because it's a really fun map. It's got a pretty you know, easy to follow BPM and it's not too fast with Hard Rock. Yeah, I have to agree. This the track, uh, the map is uh, kind of um, simple, but not too simple to play. Because as I mentioned, um, the hard rock uh, as a hard rock pick is not um, too easy to play, and but also, but it's, it's also fun to play because of the song and the mapping style. Another map that I feel is going to be picked, and this one probably by the more experienced teams, is Unhappy Refrain, which is a free mod pick. Um, I'm, I'm probably giving away a little bit here, but this is actually a really good map to pick against players that are DDKK players because there's a lot of um, monotone cat 1-4 streams, which can cause people to miss. Um, China, please don't destroy me. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely feel that there's going to be teams that end up picking that just because it, it has a lot of uh, really fun stream stuff and... It's got a lot of things that can make less experienced teams miss as well. I'm just yeah. going to wrap this up here because it's getting on for time. Uh, I'm just going to okay. wrap this uh, up with uh, the... Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to wrap this up with the lineups for the matches. Uh, on okay. Saturday at 10am, we've got Finland vs Hong Kong. At 11am, Ukraine vs Japan. 12pm, Taiwan vs Spain. 1pm, Germany vs Argentina. And then at 2, we'll have France vs Poland. That will be for Saturday, and then on the Sunday, we've got Canada vs China at 2 a.m. UCT. Okay. Uh, United States vs Philippines at 3 a.m. and Indonesia vs South Korea at 4 a.m. And that is and just oh, UCT uh, time. I was just no, going to say that. UTC Perfect. time, right. Yeah. And remember guys, um, even though this recap is helpful and everything, all this information can be found at the wiki as well, so feel free to check that just in case we might have missed something. And um, definitely look out for the next recap at the end of the round of 16. If there's anything you missed, you'll definitely be able to find out about it there. And I'd like to thank everybody that came out for the recap today. I appreciate it. And all your guys' time is incredibly value, valued to me. And remember, rhythm is only a click away, and we'll see you guys all real soon. See you guys all later. Bye.